We're here to talk about catalytic development. And what I'm going to share with you is the stories of six places and what happened there. What we see here are two images of South Lake Union in Seattle. The first is a historic aerial photo showing South Lake Union in the 80s. And you see low-rise warehouses leading up to the South Lake Union working port. And what you see on the right is a rendering of what South Lake Union um, might look like when it's completely built out. Although at this point, we hardly need the rendering. I probably should have just used the 2016 aerial that you can also see on the cover of our report if you picked up the printout. So you can see that when we're talking about catalytic development, we're talking about a dramatic transformation. Jane Jacobs, in her famous book, The Life and Death of Great American Cities, identified two models of urban development. One was what she called gradual money and is characterized by a lot of the best practices that we're hearing folks talk about in um, city building today, such as um, it being mixed use and it being incremental. And one was cataclysmic money. She wrote this during the urban renewal period and she was talking about um, waves of capital sweeping into and out of neighborhoods, often after a period of credit withholding. And she identified cataclysmic money as monolithic, institutional, sudden, characterized by the use of eminent domain and associated with infrastructure as often as it was associated with projects. To visualize this, we can think of the pre-World War II period as a golden age of American city building in which we created walkable urban places using gradual money. This is an aerial photo of Over the Rhine in Cincinnati. And we can envision a post-World War II period in which we created what we call suburban form, even when located in a downtown. This is an aerial photo of downtown Cincinnati as well. You can see the, uh, the, all of the large-scale uh, auto-oriented transportation infrastructure, the parking, the highway. <coughs> Um, centered around the stadium. So we identify these two historic periods, but also these two very different urban forms. So after, the, after World War II and after the post-war period, there were two other major um, developments in American real estate that have led to the present moment and to why catalytic development is emerging as a model now. The first is the decline of American manufacturing and the dramatic growth of the knowledge and service economies. And the second is um, the commodification of real estate. So the drivable suburban form uh, becoming a formula that is easy to copy and to replicate to create strip malls that are exactly the same, whether it's in Cincinnati or in DC or in California. Um, so basically turning real estate into a product with recognizable types that can be financed by formula and built by anyone who can get a loan. In addition, real estate is also now financialized, which means that real property debt is traded through securitized instruments and that equity investors are directly acquiring real assets as a revenue stream. And fund managers are investing in development projects as a way to provide returns to institutional investors. So there's this intersection of capital and real estate that is happening um, in a way now in, in terms of absolute dollars and in terms of um, places of intersection that is unprecedented. And so most recently we see new interest in place-based investing um, in walkable urban and not as a product but as a mission. And this started out as philanthropic and you'll hear examples of that today such as Chattanooga. But capital, and particularly equity, is now discovering that walkable urban is also more financially productive than the commoditized, drivable suburban product. And so the private sector, in the quest for returns, has taken note of these success stories and is engaging in a new entrepreneurial urbanism. So Chris talked about the conventional model of downtown redevelopment contingent on urban entertainment for activation. And we are now looking at a catalytic model of walkable urban placemaking that begins with employment. So many of these uh, investors that are at this new intersection of capital and placemaking, creating this new class of place-based investors, are actually 
major employers themselves and not just real estate investors. We spoke with many of these employers and we also spoke with their real estate partners in order to learn about their motivations, their strategies, and then to measure their outcomes. We discovered that catalytic development is a three-legged stool that rests on patient equity, which is capital that is willing to, cash capital that is willing to accept um, you know, perhaps a lower rate of return, but not necessarily, but is willing to, more most importantly, willing to wait longer than five years and willing to wait longer than one real estate cycle, perhaps surviving several recessions in order to ultimately realize their return. And that these developers are, as Chris said, integrated. They're integrated in terms of the real estate roles that they include under their full service umbrella. They do everything from acquiring land to new construction to rehab of existing assets to investing in tenants to investing in place through place management. But they also manage their portfolio um, in a way that integrates their assets with the surrounding community. And so what I'm showing here on the left is the footprint of University Park in Cambridge. And you can see that um, just looking at this abstract image of the footprints of University Park, that when MIT and Forest City acquired these former factory parcels, they reconnected these large parcels to the street grid, subdividing them, and creating a seamless development that doesn't feel like a closed campus. And if you go there and ask the average person in Cambridge, they may not even necessarily be aware that all of the buildings around the University Park Commons were built by the same developer. These are the six case studies that you're gonna hear from today. We have representatives from all of these cities here with us to tell you in their own words and with their own voices why they did what they did and how they did it. One thing that we have learned is that catalytic development originates from a place of crisis and I think that everyone in this room is probably familiar with the bankruptcy in downtown Detroit, but actually the crisis of downtown Detroit has been unfolding for a long time and is now turning around. Um, we're gonna hear from uh, the Downtown Detroit Partnership that manages Campus Martius, which is the space that's marked by the number one on this map. So you can see it's right in the center of what's been happening in downtown Detroit. And we'll hear about the extraordinary investment of Rock Ventures, which is the parent company of Quicken Loans and is owned by Dan Gilbert, which now owns 27% of the parcel area inside the People Mover Loop, and 25% of the people who work in downtown Detroit called Dan Gilbert their boss. So it's an astounding concentration of investment in a single place in which the success of Rock Ventures and Quicken Loans is now interlinked with the success of the city of Detroit, and they are co-investors in this place. Between 2010, which is the year after Rock Ventures started moving to downtown Detroit, and 2015, residential vacancy downtown declined 10.4%, even though it increased in Wayne County as a whole by 11.4% during the same time period. And office vacancy, of naturally, <laughs> with all of Rock Ventures employees moving downtown declined 6.5% closing the gap between Detroit and Wayne County during this period. Downtown Chattanooga is, uh, one of, is our longest standing case study that has been in the process of redeveloping since the 1980s. And we'll hear from uh, someone who was there <laughs> at the beginning and who is still there today. So as you can see from the timeline, this is a very long story, but also a story that originates in crisis where um, downtown Chattanooga was a place to work and had a stable employment base, but was not a place to stay. And a college education was viewed as a ticket out of Chattanooga and not as a ticket to a job in Chattanooga and to stay there and raise a family. So we're gonna hear about how Chattanooga turned their um, population decline around because between 1990 and 2015, the residential population of downtown increased uh, an almost inconceivable 53%. Even, and while Hamilton County, Tennessee as a whole was growing during the same time period, the rate of growth in downtown Chattanooga was twice that. 
of their county seat. And between, 27, between 2007 and 2016, retail vacancy declined 8%. Um, and this is during a time where it's pretty tough out there in retail. So it's really remarkable that, down, that a small city like Chattanooga is able to achieve these retail outcomes. Also between 2007 and 2016, um, despite this growth, um, Chattanooga was able to uh, increase the returns that, uh, that property owners are receiving from their investments because retail rents rose 72% even though average retail rents per square foot in Hamilton, Hamilton County as a whole were declining. We're going to hear from Steve Leeper of 3CDC in Cincinnati. Um, Cincinnati is another case of catalytic development originating from crisis. In the Over the Rhine neighborhood of Cincinnati, um, the, the first civil disorder of the 21st century caused by a police shooting of a young African-American man happened in Cincinnati in 2001. And uh, because of the civil unrest that happened after that incident, and because of um, the interest of the many Fortune 500 companies that are headquartered in Cincinnati in, in staying there and investing in their place, um, the city and these companies worked together to create the Cincinnati Center, Center City Development Corporation and to acquire a really astounding parcel assembly of mostly historic buildings that they have rehabilitated, raising the median for sale home price in downtown city in downtown Cincinnati by 319% between 2000 and 2015. And while, of course, home values also rose during Hamilton County, Ohio, <laughs> during this time period, um, this rate of increase is like five times what was happening in Hamilton County. Also, between 2000 and 2015, retail rents per square foot went up 107% in downtown and over the Rhine and are now outperforming average retail rents in Hamilton County. We'll also hear about HQ1, as Chris mentioned. This is uh, the South Lake Union neighborhood in Seattle, which is a former industrial neighborhood. Many of the sites of catalytic development that we looked at in our case study uh, were available for redevelopment because of the decline of manufacturing and the rise of the knowledge and service economies, leaving available parcels for redevelopment that would not otherwise have been available. And that was the case in South Lake Union. We'll hear about um, uh, Vulcan Inc.'s gradual acquisition of 60 acres within the South Lake Union neighborhood and how they transformed a neighborhood that in 2000 had only three people per acre living in it to a vibrant residential community today that is home to over 5,000 people. Residential density increased 92% in South Lake Union in just 15 years. And while Seattle and King County as a whole were growing during that time period, uh, this growth rate is almost 10 times that. And also between 2010 and 2015, um, Vulcan added 10 million square feet of new office, which represents almost 30% of all inventory added in all of King County during this time period. And finally, we'll, oh, sorry, not finally, we have two more after this. So we'll also hear from uh, Forest City REIT, uh, the developer of University Park in Cambridge. Um, MIT acquired a collection of abandoned factories and other smaller parcels around it very gradually starting in the 1970s and into the 1980s um, and eventually was able to assemble um, this big chunk that would represent like 25% of the MIT campus if they had expanded into this space. But instead, um, MIT, Forest City, and the city of Cambridge worked together to create a vision for a mixed-use development that could provide a home for innovation growing out of MIT, but also add very much desired retail and commercial amenities to the Cambridge Port neighborhood as a whole, including 137 units of affordable housing. Between 1980 and 2010, Forest City built 884 housing units, increasing the density of this area to 25 people per acre, which is really remarkable given that Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville as a whole only have an average of 12 people per acre. So really establishing a new benchmark for what urban density even means 
in the Boston, New England context and what it looks like and how it feels. And between 1980 and 2010, also adding 1.7 million square feet of commercial real estate to the Cambridge tax base. In addition to all of the property taxes generated by University Park, two of the top 10 payers of personal property tax in Cambridge are University Park tenants today. And finally, we'll learn about ASU's development of a new campus in downtown Phoenix. So uh, many of you may be familiar with Arizona State University since it's the biggest state university in the United States. Um, but their main campus is actually in Tempe. And that's still where most ASU students are today. But in 2006, ASU co-invested with the city of Phoenix in order to develop a new campus in the downtown of the state capital and to bring the College of Nursing and other programs wholly relocated into downtown Phoenix. I think that in terms of crisis, we're all familiar with the housing bubble that burst in, this, in the first decade of the 21st century. And we know that uh, Maricopa County was one of the very, very hot spots for that. Between 2000 and 2010, the population of downtown Phoenix in just 10 years fell almost 10%. But between 2010 and 2015, in just five years, downtown Phoenix grew 17%, which would be the equivalent of 6% growth from the 2000 baseline. So not just a recovery and not just a rebirth, but really a recreation of a new walkable downtown that historically Phoenix never really had. Between 2006 and 2016, commercial rents in downtown Phoenix rose 27%, even though they were declining in Maricopa County as a whole during this time period. In our paper, we identify 12 lessons for catalytic developers, philanthropy, city leaders, and urbanists. But rather than repeat these 12 lessons to you now, let's hear directly from our six case studies about how they achieved these remarkable outcomes and the places that they have built. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.